The term bystander effect refers to the phenomenon in which the greater the number of people present, the less likely people are to help a person in distress. When an emergency situation occurs, observers are more likely to take action if there are few or no other witnesses. The most frequently cited example of the bystander effect is the brutal murder of a young woman named Catherine Genovese. On March 13, 1964, Catherine Genovese, known as Kitty, arrived home in Kew Gardens, Queens, from her job behind the bar at Ebb's 11th Hour on Jamaica Avenue in Hollis. She parked in a lot adjacent to the Kew Gardens. Around 3.20 a.m., she turned off the lights of her car, locked the door, and started to walk the 100 feet to the entrance of her apartment at 8270 Austin Street. Kitty noticed a man at the far end of the lot. She hesitated, then nervously headed up Austin Street toward a call box. She got as far as a nearby streetlight before the man grabbed her. She screamed. <coughs> Lights went on in the 10-story apartment house at 8267 Austin Street. Windows slid open and voices punctuated the early morning stillness. From one of the upper windows in the apartment house, a man called down. Hey man, leave that girl alone. The assailant looked up at him, shrugged, and walked down Austin Street. I've been stabbed! Somebody help me! Oh. Help! Miss Genovese struggled to her feet. Somebody please! Help me! Lights in the apartments went out. The killer returned to Miss Genovese, now trying to make her way around the side of the building by the parking lot to get to her apartment. No, the assailant please. stabbed her again. She shrieked. Oh, no, I'm dying. Windows were opening again and lights went on in many apartments. The assailant got into his car and drove away. Miss Genovese, staggering to her feet. It was 3.35 a.m. There was still hope, but Kitty's night wasn't over. The assailant returned. By then, Miss Genovese had crawled to the back of the building where the hallways of the apartment building held out hope for safety. The killer found her slumped on the floor at the foot of the stairs. He stabbed her a third time, fatally. It was 3.50 by the time the police received their first call from a man who was a neighbor of Miss Genovese. In two minutes, they were at the scene. The neighbor, a 70-year-old woman, and another woman were the only persons on the street. Nobody else came forward. The man explained that he had called the police after much deliberation. He had phoned a friend in Nassau County for advice, and then he had crossed the roof of the building to the apartment of the elderly woman to get her to make the call. He sheepishly told the police. Other witnesses from the neighborhood find it difficult to explain why they didn't call the police. A housewife, knowingly, if quite casually, said, We thought it was a lover's quarrel. A husband admitted. Well, frankly, my wife and I were afraid. A distraught woman, wiping her hands in her apron, said, I didn't want my husband to get involved. A woman peeked out from a slight opening in the doorway to her apartment and rattled off an account of the killer's second attack. Why hadn't she called the police at the time? I was tired. I went back to bed. They seemed aware of the fact that events might have been different. It was 4.25 a.m. when the ambulance arrived to take the body of Miss Genovese. It drove off. Only then, one solemn police detective said, did the people come out. Winston Mosley, a 29-year-old business machine operator, was charged with the homicide. Mosley had no previous record. He was married, had two children, and owned a home at 13319 Sutter Avenue, South Ozone Park, Queens. A court committed him to Kings County Hospital for psychiatric observation. When questioned by the police, Mosley admitted to killing two other women. He had three chances to kill Kitty during a 35-minute period. He returned twice to complete the job. If the police had been called when he first attacked, she might still be alive. 
for more than half an hour, 38 respectable, law-abiding citizens in Queens watched a killer stalk and stab a woman in three separate attacks in Kew Gardens. Twice, their chatter and the sudden glow of their bedroom lights interrupted him and frightened him off. Each time, he returned, sought her out, and stabbed her again. Not one person telephoned the police during the assault. But the bystander effect isn't always a matter of life or death. Believe it or not, we experience the bystander effect almost on a daily basis. For instance, several experiments have found that in busy cities, pedestrians often walk by people who collapse on the sidewalk. There are so many people present, no one feels it is their responsibility to help. Have you ever driven past a broken down vehicle whose motorist is in distress, justifying your inaction by saying to yourself, someone else will help them? This is the result of the bystander effect. Even our reluctance to pick up litter can be explained by this psychological principle. Why should I have to pick up that trash when someone else can too? Although giving in to the bystander effect and shrugging individual responsibility for our actions may not always result in the death of an innocent woman, it often has undesirable consequences. And if we do not practice personal integrity, it is likely we will soon fall into an apathetic state where our motto becomes, let someone else handle it. Every day, every choice, we must fight against the bystander effect and take the personal initiative to improve the world and to help others. Smell like spring and delight. You know what I mean. <laughs> How about a seven on the screen scale? I think that would all do it. Dating a lumberjack? Less likely people are to help a person in distress. When an emergency. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez, Joe. Yeah. Gotta be a rebel. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. 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 I can't stop Harder. Okay. Alright, look at me. I'm a scary police officer. No, you're not. <laughs> you're a joke. 